All right. Hey guys, it's me and I'm back again. I miss you all so very much. So we got some very interesting news today from the College Board. So for all the AP exams that College Board's offering in the 2019-2020 school year, they're all now online. And interesting facts about your new AP exam. It is only going to be 45 minutes long. So for the AP art history exam, you are only required to answer questions and you're only going to be asked questions from units one through six. So that's prehistory, ancient Mediterranean, later Europe, early Europe, indigenous Americas and Africa. So what we're going to have to do between now and the AP exams is study indigenous America and art of New Spain, which is technically in the later Europe. So Renaissance, all that stuff. So it's technically chunked into there. So, if you, this is all the college word units, so, in your actual barons, that's going to be units 1 through 22, and this is um, 20th century, and then 26, which is Art of the Americas, and 27, which is Africa. I think I said Africa, so unit 6 is Africa. So, what's going to be different now? There are going to be two different testing dates, so one in April, I assume, and then one in May. It's not going to be your normal AP exam day, I don't believe, but it will be sometime in May, so... If you feel prepared now, or close to now, and you really want to just crunch and just get it over with, you can do the early one, or you can do the later one. So, as I said, only 45 minutes long, take it online at home, and your composition, so the actual test, multiple choice, free response, we don't know yet. So we're going to find that out April 6th. So, I'm going to assume, and this is just a guess, that it's going to be maybe 20 or 30 multiple choice questions with one 15-minute essay question. I, I can only assume. And, um, so, since we have all this new information, and as I said, we have to study Indigenous America and Art of New Spain. So, what I did last year, I taught four out of the six works of Art of New Spain, so I'm going to teach five out of the six works here. I'm not going to do the Virgin Guadalupe with, um, the pearls. Someone else can do that, or you can do that on your own. But this is going to be a start-off for me to help you guys review, the, review for the AP exam. So, I know you guys just finished China and Korea, which sucks, and I know you guys just got through that, and I hear you did a really good job on it, but that is not going to be on your AP exam. Global Contemporary, Art of China and Korea, and Japan, I believe that's all, is not going to be on your AP exam, which sucks. So this exam is really going to be very Eurocentric, which is what I hope College Board is trying to get away from, and it's what they went away from in last year's AP exam and my AP exam. But College Board is really just digging in to those units because that's what teachers are supposed to have covered by now. So, I've taken up a lot of time talking about this. I want to get this done in 30 minutes, so five works in 30 minutes. Let's do it. So, before we talk about the Codex Mendoza, let's talk about the Art of New Spain. So, we'll go back just to this slide. So, the Art of New Spain. So, 1500 to, 1500 to 1820 CE. So, we're in the Common Era. And what the Art of New Spain is, so, in 1500 or thereabouts, the Spanish and Portuguese colonists went from Portugal and Spain to the New World, quote-unquote. So what that was is just essentially the Western Hemisphere, so the Pacific, not the Pacific Islands, um, North America, South America, and all the islands thereabouts. So we're having these colonizers or conquistadors come and colonize Peru, Mexico, the whole North American continent. And it just um, the Aztec Empire, the Incan Empire, and the Aztec, Inca, and the Mayan Empire. So what these people are doing is they are decimating these native people's culture. They are bringing their own culture, bringing their own food, and enforcing them, enforcing their native values, not their native values, their European values on these native people. So not only does this squish culture, but it also brings what's known as... Um, not brought, I'm sorry. And if this might happen a couple of times since I'm doing this all in one take, so bear with me. So when this happens, there's something called the Columbian Exchange. So new foods and technology and also diseases being brought from the New World, which is the Western Hemisphere, to the Old World, which is Europe. So one of the biggest, biggest consequences of the Columbian Exchange was known as the Great Dying. So Europeans had a lot a lot of diseases. One of the most infectious was the plague and syphilis. So, since, 
That was fun. Let's bring that back. That was easy. All right. Sorry about that, folks. So, what happened? The great dying. So, in these different tribes throughout North and South America, almost 90% of native populations are dying due to, due to um, European diseases. Since, obviously, they haven't been exposed to, exposed to these diseases, they have no way to fight back. So, they just... Their immune systems are compromised and they just end up dying. So in some areas of North and South America, 90% of the native population die. And that is what I really want you to take away from this. So Europeans coming to this new world are bringing prosperity in some way and bringing new food and wealth. But they're also really, really hurting the native populations, which is not good, which is what we want to show. Because there are goods and bads to every aspect of art history. And... Um, one more thing I want to point out. What was the one more thing I wanted to point out? I forget. It'll come back to me. But let's get into our first work. The Codex Mendoza. The frontispiece of the Codex Mendoza. Pigment on paper, 1542. And I'm going to post this on Google Classroom. And I'll put it in the description of the YouTube video or whatever. So that you guys can follow along with it if you so choose. So, frontispiece of the Codex Mendoza, and I'm just going to read all this out, and since I'm going to provide you with the link, I'm not going to give time for writing, blah, 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 so you can pause, whatever. And if you guys want me to elaborate on some stuff in a different video or whatever, I can do that for you. Um, so, background. So, named after the Viceroy of New Spain, and what New Spain was was just essentially Mexico. So, the Mexican region was called New Spain, because that's where a lot of Mexican conquistadors are settling with their families. So Antonio de Mendoza is the viceroy of New Spain. So viceroy was just a central word for leader, monarch, whatever. This is intended to be a history of the Aztecs for Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire. So the Holy Roman Empire was still around during this time since this is the 16th century. And what historians at this era want to do is show what native life is like because people like Charles V aren't having a good exposure and don't really know what life is like in New Spain. So things like this are created to show them what life is really like. So this is created 20 years after the Spanish conquest of Mexico, North and South America. And this shows Aztec rulers and daily life in Mexico, which is what really these rulers want to see because you're not going to funnel all this money into conquistadors and into settling this new land if you can't even see what the real world is like. If you see what the people are living and see what they're doing in the real life. So, what we're having here, an eagle is perched on top of a cactus tree, and that ends up being um, the center of the Mexican flag, what we know now. And we're having common people, um, houses, trees, foliage, rituals, food. We're having a lot of this stuff, so this was really a an accurate description, an accurate depiction and description of what Aztec life was like. So a codex is just an ancient manuscript in a book form. So this is just the frontispiece. So what a frontispiece is, I think we studied one in Byzantine, just the front page or one of the front pages of a book that is usually an illustration followed by some text. So this is using pictographs created by Aztec artists that were later annotated in Spanish. So pictographs, think of hieroglyphics, thereabouts, um, pictures that are used to describe words or have um, verbal or textural meaning. So this scene is depicting the foundation of the Tectaculon and the conquest of the... Whoa! <laughs> I think I, I had a hard time on this last year. Alright, so let's try this again. So the scene depicts the founding of Tetachalon and the conquest of the Cohechen and, uh, and Teneyukin on the bottom. Sorry, that was terrible, but whatever <laughs> so symbolism and representation so enemy temples are on fire while Aztec warriors carry clubs and shields so this could be either a a realistic depiction of what Aztec life was like or it could be Europeans playing a little bit of a satirical joke not necessarily a joke but a superiority move so since Europeans automatically thought they were better than these native people they were depicting them as savage and barbarish and just really lower than them, which is what they actually saw them as. And we'll get to that when we go into one of our later works that actually shows what the social structure in this place was like. So these are our Aztecs. This is their enemy temple. And these are their clubs. So get a higher resolution image when you're on your own doing this work. But I just want you to know that um, this is just a bit of a close-up and a bit of what 
actually King Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire was seen. So we're having a small representation of the Templo Mayor above the eagle. And I think you will learn about Templo Mayor when you study the indigenous Americas. And it, what that unit is, is actually what the people were creating. So their architecture and their um, culture, what they were like. And this is just the European perspective and what they chartered in um, their art making. So skulls represent the sacrifice of victims. So we're having skulls be, we're having some skulls here, skulls here. We're having skulls, oh, whoops. We're having skulls throughout the work depict um, sacrifice victims. And what is a common theme when you get to this unit and to the indigenous Americas, skulls are very, skulls and bones are very sacred and people take them into a lot of um, rituals and it's very important in their culture. So, um, wow, I really just did not put a lot of effort into this last year um, for the heading at least. So the eagle standing on the cactus at the intersection of the two waterways commemorates the decision of the to attach a lot into four quadrants. So we're having, as I said, so this is the frontispiece and this is the text that surrounds it. So we're having four quadrants, if you can see my little laser, four quadrants, and then this eagle surrounded by the cactus and the snake is uniting these four quadrants into two waterways. So waterway, waterway, etc., etc. So that's this unit. And then this is the actual Mexican flag. You should recognize it. So we're having eagle, eagle, cactus, cactus, snake, snake in the mouth. Okay, good. So that's one work. Let's move on to the folding screen with the siege of the Belgrade and hunting scene. So this is a double-sided work of art and we're going to get into the other side. So this right here, it's a bit of a terrible image since this projector that I have is not all that awesome, uh, at least for the screen I'm using it on. So this is one scene and this is the hunting scene. And then the other scene will just be the, um, no, I believe this is the siege. The other scene will be more majestic, more green, and a little bit more colorful. This is a lot of reds and um, reds and oranges and beiges. And this is 1697 to 1701, tempera and resin on wood inlaid with mother of pearl. And that is a very common, that is a very common medium during this unit, mother of pearl. And that's just pearl. So when you get to the Virgin Guadalupe, whether someone else does that, Timory does that, or um, you studied on your own, you're going to have that um, be a very common unit of um, medium. So, patron and background. So, commissioned by Jose, Su Jose Sarmiento de Valasares, Viceroy of New Spain. So, we're having a Viceroy of um, Spain a couple years ago, or a couple decades ago, um, change into this new one since life, expense life expectancy isn't all that high. So this is a display of the Vice Regal of the Vice Regal Palace in Mexico City. Only known example of an artwork that combines ooh, biombos and enconchas. So a biombo is a folding screen and an enconchado is a style of painting. And enconchado, um, you will also get into when you do the Virgin Guadalupe inlaid with Mother of Pearl. So this is the hunting scene. So even though the screen is a little terrible, um, my screen, not this screen, you can see the greens, the greens, the reds, the more vibrant colors, and the people. So we're having a lot of green, a lot of red, and a lot of just nature. And this is what's depicted on the hunting scene. So not a lot of violence, but you are having men on horses hunting animals for game. So this is the second side of the screen and is one depiction of people hunting. The other is a depiction of war other um the siege of belgrade so a siege is just a coordinated attack on a certain place so the hunting scene is suited for an intimate space and small receptions so this was placed in the vice regal palace and if the viceroy had guests over or something like that he would flip it to the hunting scene so it's calm nice and just a little bit more mellow so the war scene the siege of the belgrade so this war scene is more suited to war a grander room with more political importance. So if you're having military guests over from Spain or Portugal or Britain or something like that, you're going to want to flip it over to the Belgrade scene to show that you have military power and to show that you can really just throw, um, not throw, flaunt your stuff and show that you are able to just siege a whole city at will. You have that power and you really want to just show it off. So this war scene depicts a contemporary event of the Great Turkish War between 16... 83 and 1699. 
So this is a Dutch print used for inspiration and illustrations of the Habsburg power. So the Habsburgs are the leading family that live in um, Austria-Hungary during this time. And Austria-Hungary were one country instead of being Austria and Hungary. And they really had a disagreement with the Turks for a long time. So one of their many wars was the Great Turkish War during this time. And this is just a picture of them. So that was quick. That was an easy one. So you just need to know that both sides, what the purpose is for both sides and what you should, um, and what is going to be depicted. So this is the angel with the arquebus. 1680 CE, oil on canvas, master of Calamara. So the angel himself. So this angel is depicted with an arquebus, which is pretty obvious. Um, there's only one other thing that would really be classified as an arquebus, the rifle. So the rifle is an arquebus, um, a form of rifle, as I just said. I've said that like five times. So what is interesting about this work is that there is no depiction of a sword. Instead, it's a rifle. And that's really depicting the changing of times in this era. So usually, battles were fought with swords and not rifles. So we're having a moving into a different time in this work. Military poses is derived from a European engraving of military exercises. So we're having a military pose being that he's pointing the rifle upwards. His stance is a little um, raised and he is ready to um, fire that firearm. And what's also interesting about this is he is in an, what's known as an androgynous um, pose as well. So his pose is neither necessarily masculine or necessarily feminine. And neither is his face. So the angel as a whole is very androgynous. So we're having a drapery of 17th century Spanish aristocrats. So lots of gold, lots of um, big castles, lots of um, just big sleeves. And that was a really big thing in showing how much power you had and how much wealth that you had. Big sleeves, lots of gold. The bigger that your outfit was, the more power and wealth that you were said to have. And then we're having this be a part of a series. Um, could be angels with drums, could be angels with guns, but likely part of a series with other angels. So this is a close-up of our angel's face, and we'll get to his lower part um, in a second. So we're having him wear a regal hat with feathers, this long, large um, tunic almost, and then a um, lot of lace, and then his rifle. So this work has a mannerist influence in the stiffness of the figure and the dance-like pose. So if we remember man mannerism, this is a very weird stage in art history, transitioning from the Renaissance to Rococo. So figures are very stiff, angular, but also very elongated with their necks, their arms, everything about them was just a little off. And that's what made mannerism mannerism. It wouldn't be mannerism if it wasn't just a little weird. So we're having a Latin inscription on this picture. Azazel fear God. Oh, I didn't even put a closed parenthesis on that. My bad. So, gold embroidery on the fabric favored by the indigenous people of Spain. So what we're having in this unit specifically is a lot of cultural melding. So the European culture in that this big, large dress or suit or tunic, and then a little bit of the native um, charm with the gold embroidery on the fabric. So. And then we'll get into the next work, um, which will show you even more how these cultures are combining into one. Or at least some, how they are. So, culture. Funny that we talk about that. So, we're having a relationship between these images and the winged warriors of pre-Columbian art. And then, this may have originated in the region around Titicaca in the Cayo um, region of Peru. So, we have no real idea where this comes from, but we can figure out by the um, gold embroidery and some other things like that where it might have come from. So could be Peru, could not be, we don't know. And that's, I mean, we're used to not knowing where things come from in our history. So that is the angel with the arquebus and let's get into Spaniard and Indian produce a mestizo. So this is my favorite work of this unit because it shows what life was really like for people who married interclass. So this was attributed to Juan Rodriguez, circa 1715, oil on canvas. Let's get into it. So during this time, there was this chart that showed what a combination of two people would make. So if a Spaniard and a Spaniard had a child, it would be called X. 
if a, if a, let's go back, if a Spaniard and an Indian or a Native American had a child, it would be called a mestizo. And there were just a bunch of combinations. And um, I think this goes up to maybe, I believe it goes up to 16 charts or 16 boxes to show how many different combinations there are. So you could have a native Aztec, a native American, a Spaniard, the child of a Spaniard. Um, and the child of a Spaniard that was born in America is different than an actual Spaniard. It's weird. It's a, it's a whole process and it's a lot of different um, societal implications that we're having here. But that's why I find this so interesting because there are so many different classifications of what um, these people are producing for their children. So social hierarchy. Spanish social hierarchy with European ancestry at the top and 16 different graduations of the social scale. So if you really wanted to be at the top, well, you didn't really have a way to get up there. But if you were a Spaniard born in Spain that came to America, you would be number one on that list because you were born from a Spaniard, a Spaniard producing a Spaniard in Spain. And then second would likely be a Spaniard and a Spaniard produce a Spaniard in America. And that would be technically a lower run, which is weird. It's a whole thing. So Spanish blood is linked to civilia, is linked into civilizing forces wearing lavish costumes. So the lower we go, the more peasant-ish that the people are getting. So up here we're having um, fancy shoes, socks, hats. And then down here we're having um, lower class dresses, guitars, um, more manual labor is being depicted. Up here, there's almost no manual labor. This person is holding a whip. And then down here, holding bread, grain, stuff like that. So, yet again, no heading. Yay, I put just so much effort into this. I really hope you guys can really get that. Um, so this panel... Oh my god, that's terrible. I can't even read that. Um, so this panel, from the first known series of the Costa paintings, may have not been a completed set. So these were known as castas. So all these, um, all these boxes are different castas, meaning just different classes. So a casta, a painting depicted people of a mixed race. So Spanish colonists commissioned works to be sent abroad to show how the caste system of the new world works. So if we know anything about the caste system, so say in India, you were, there are a bunch of different castes. So and if you are born into a middle class caste, you cannot go up or down. You are stuck to that for life. Just like this. If you are born a mestizo, you cannot become a Creole or a um, something else. The only one I remember is Creole. Um, you are stuck into that for life. So not commissioned art objects, but illustrations of ethnic groups. So what these European leaders aren't wanting is bowls and pots made from these people, made from this land. They're wanting to see what different combinations of people are making and what the actual class system is like and what the actual society is like. And that's really what these people want. They want to be able to see what the life is like for their colony since they actually own these colonies and technically the way that they viewed it, they own these people, these Macisos, these Creoles, these um, Native Americans, they were all under Spanish ownership, which sucks, but that's just how it was. So, Africans and Indians are rendered with respect, showing harmony of mixed classes. So, this is very different from the way that British people show African Americans and Native Americans, or Africans. Um, these people are showing them with respect, with dignity, not drawing them as savages or drawing them with crude markings or something like that. They're showing respect, and that is a very interesting thing to see in this unit, that people are shown with respect even though that cultures are different. So many Africans and Indians are rendered with South European features, slim noses, curly hairs, and almond-shaped eyes, and also European clothing. So this is not traditional African um, or Native American clothing. So yeah, we're having a lot of European influence on these um, non-European people. So let's move into the last one. Portrait of Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, Miguel Cabrera, Ca, Cabrera, 1750, oil on canvas. So this is Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. She is a very, very, very important woman in early feminism. So you'll find that out. So Juana Inés de la Cruz, she was a child prodigy and a Creole woman. 
became a nun in 1699 at the age of 18, and she was a very large literary figure who published books that were read throughout the New Spain, throughout Europe. She wrote poetry, theatrical pieces, and all of them were very based, were very much based in um, female equality. So she had, um, so she had women being on the same side as men, being on the same social rung as men, being able to do the same things as men. And that's why she's such an important woman in early feminism. She was really breaking the mold of what a woman could be in New Spain society. So covenants were a place of feminist culture. So a covenant is just um, where nuns live. So Cruz maintained a great library. So this is a picture of her in her library. So this is her with her um, Bible quill. This is a, um, we'll get into what this is later, her rosary. And then this grand library behind her. Um, I think we can go back and see it's very, very large, and I'm sure um, if you get an even bigger picture, it's even larger. And this is instrumental in giving girls an education in um, a male... Did I write Maine? I wrote Maine. I'm very sorry about that. In a male-dominated world. So, the actual painting. So, she's wearing a Mexican habit, which is just a nun's uniform, essentially, of the religious order of Hermits of St. Jerome. She's seated in the library, surrounded by symbols of her faith and her learning. So, the rosary, the Bible, um, I'm pretty sure we have some religious images up here. And then, paint. this painting is done 55 years after her death for her admirers. So, since she was such a big person in feminist culture, she was commemorated with this painting. Because she played such a big role in um, making women be viewed as the same as men. So, um, that is it for this one. So, guys, that was a lot. And if you guys want me to do the Virgin Guadalupe, I will do that for you. And also, I'm giving you the option. If you guys want me to create any videos for any of the works that we've done or any of the ones that we have not done so far, so Indigenous Americas or, like I said, Guadalupe, I will be willing to do that for you. All you need to do is ask. And I will make a video so that you can review it on your own time. If there isn't a Khan Academy video for a work that you really have a hard time on and there isn't enough information in the bearings for you, I'll make a video on it going into a little bit more depth for you so that you can review whenever you want so you can get ready for this online AP exam. Um, if you have any questions for me about anything, um, I'll, make, um, I'll make a post, I'll make a video, I'll do something for you. Um, cause I'm here for you. I want to make sure everyone passes this exam and I want to make sure everyone's just up to date, not scared, no anxiety, make sure everyone's good. Make sure everyone's breathing. I know we're, we've been off school for a week. Make sure everyone's good. And I will also make three or one. Or, I'm sorry. So I will make a couple more videos on the other three. Oh, do I really need to do that? Well, for your benefit, I will make three more videos on the other three essays that you might see, maybe. So your other 30 minute and your two other 15 minute essays, I will make videos on those just in case that they happen to pop up on your 45 minute AP exam. Um, that's been Art of New Spain and I will keep you guys updated the best way I can and I hope this helped. Stay safe guys.